Hat coffee and so. So we just had a wonderful talks on uh, wonderful talk on broadcasting and how we can replace Scala indices. And so we're gonna go on now with uh, future of for loops with Peter. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so my name's Peter. Um, I'm a second year grad student at MIT. Um, I think that the the story of how I came to Julia is in a way surprisingly normal. Um, at, at the time, I was a young numerical analyst. The, the world was the world was a younger, simpler place, um, and I was writing a I was writing a library to do linear algebra on a modified floating point type. It was a, it had it did some you know funky addition and stuff and various orders. And one of the things about writing this linear algebra library was that I wasn't because I needed a specific order of operation. Um, I couldn't just use the dash f fast math and have the compiler reorder all my ops. Um, so one of the things I had to do was I, I started writing a Python library to generate C code to write my linear algebra library. Um, I learned about Julia. I came to MIT. I saw the light. Um, I met a whole bunch of wonderful people, uh, Valentin and Jared and everybody, and they, they introduced me to a really cool community. Um, so uh, this is... This is some of the, the horror show before I saw <laughs> before I saw the light. We even had an auto tuner uh, for for this thing, and I mean I, I say horror show, but it's actually it's it's a solid library. I I, I love the thing. Um, so so um, uh, well while I was at MIT, um, I met I met a man named uh, Frederick Kolstad, um, and he he was working on this this compiler. Um, it was a it was a tensor compiler. Uh, the topic of this talk, um, and. It, 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 what it could do was it could take these sparse arrays in sort of a very generic format, um, and it would it would compile completely an expression for whatever arrays that you had, and it was, you, you know it was very nice to use. And I, I saw this, and I had I had just learned about Julia, and I said you know we really need to integrate this into Julia, um, and it turned out to be a little bit harder than I thought to to integrate it, and I'll talk about why. Um, so I'm I'm currently working still on this integration. Um, but I think that what, what I really would like to do here is just kind of give you an overview of what I learned throughout the process and kind of hopefully get you excited for a little bit for some of, these, some of these really cool pieces of technology that I'm choosing to call tensor compilers here. Sometimes people call them like scheduling languages or, or et cetera. Um, but so, so this, this slide um, motivates everything that I do and everything that a lot of people here do. Um, I don't know if you've seen this slide before. Uh, I've taken it verbatim minus messy uh, from the uh, LA Pack working notes, uh, and this was this was sort of one of the uh, motivations for writing LA Pack. Um, and and so when they wrote this slide, they said bullet points three through five could be automated. Um, and and I I hope to convince you throughout this talk that. Um, even if we add these additional um, additional expansions to this problem, um, I, I still think that this will probably be something that we can automate in the next couple of years, um, in a very in a very general or in, in a very streamlined way. Um, so, if you're going to write something that can compile a tensor operation, you need to answer a couple questions. And all software is about lasagna stacks like this. Um, so we have uh, we have applications. Um, we're going uh, left to right here. We have some applications. We have interfaces. We have policy, and we have mechanisms. So the applications is sort of uh, we have to answer the question of how uh, what what operations do we need to be able to support? Um, we need to say how do we express those operations with an interface? Um, and then policy and mechanism are two phases of compilation of these programs. Um, policy is determining a schedule or like a set of um, high-level directives of how we're actually going to execute our code. And mechanism is the process of going from our high-level schedule to you know, very fast uh, parallel or you know, whatever code. Um, so an example schedule is something like, OK, well, you know, I mean, we've all optimized C programs before. There's you know, maybe like five different techniques that you can do it. Uh, you can you know, enroll, vectorize. Um, you block, you uh, maybe maybe you parallelize a loop. You know, there's just a couple things that you do, and so maybe the the schedule is that I unroll loop five and I uh, vectorize the inner loop, and that's my schedule. And then mechanism would be how do we implement that? But um, 
without getting too much in the details here, um, I think that uh, the answer to question two kind of, uh, it, it changes how we think about the rest of this stack. Um, if, if, if we can answer that one correctly, we can kind of start filling in the rest of it. So um, just a history of uh, interfaces here. Um, for loops have been around since computers have been around. Um, originally, it was a German word. Uh, and <laughs> I, I won't try and pronounce it. Um, I, I can't get the R right when I say it. But um, so, so one of the things, I mean, control, uh, for loops are, um, they're, they're very simple. They're easy to understand. Um, when you see a nested set of for loops, you kind of, you know what it's doing if it's a simple set of for loops. But if you want it to go fast, oh, Valentin has a, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I could ask you to do that. But. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, the, the problem with for loops is that um, if you want them to go fast, you have to sacrifice their almost self-documenting quality of um, what they're doing. Um, you're trading off performance with the clarity and flexibility of, of the construct. Um, so you can sort of move on. Uh, at, at some point, people said, well, we've written all of these for loops, and we, it's kind of hard to make them fast. But there's a, a set of common ones that everybody kind of uses. So they made, uh, they made the first flaws. That's basic linear algebra subprograms. Um, and the, the one there means that those are the order one operations. So eventually, uh, they, said, they, they, they sort of said at, when flaws one was created, oh, well, we can build a matrix multiply out of a set of dot products, right? But, Eventually, our caches became complicated enough that sort of you needed these higher level routines to efficiently utilize your machine, and so they made a more complicated library. Um, and, uh, you don't just have named functions. Um, it's not just a name set of functions that we agree upon. Sometimes people use operators. They come up with you know, very interesting syntax, NumPy, and, and Julia, of course, has a really good syntax for uh, specifying some of these operations. But, um, Named operations uh, can sometimes trade uh, performance for their expressiveness. So this, this is a call to the plots um, to do a matrix multiply. Uh, this description field is a eight character um, vector. It takes integers. Uh, and and the, the reason I'm showing you this is that uh, using for loops, or sorry, using, using um, functions as sort of an intermediate representation or something that's like a very expressible way to, you know, uh, ha to, to implement a generic library can, can sometimes lead to uh, code that's difficult to support. So, I mean, I, I guess the sort of what I'm getting to here is that we really do need an IR. And I'm putting index notation there, but it really it doesn't go there, it goes there, it's been here forever. Um, this is sort of just the summation conventions that we've always, we've always sort of used. And it's, it's, it's actually rather intuitive. So what is index notation? Um, so the general rule, um, there's sometimes several, there's, there's sometimes different rules. But the general rule here is that uh, what we're going to do is we'll, we'll, we have this expression. We have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The right-hand side is an element-wise expression. And we evaluate that element-wise expression over all combinations of the indices, and then we're going to use some reduction operator to reduce the indices that aren't used on the left-hand side. Um, sometimes people uh, explain this as saying we're going to contract the repeated indices if you're from sort of a tensor contraction world. One of the disadvantages of doing that is that you can't like represent something like a sum of a vector, right? There's no repeated index in the sum of a vector. Um, and, and another uh, defining feature of index notation is that usually people infer the um, extents of the indices, the, the ranges over which they will vary from the array sizes themselves. So you don't, you don't usually have to specify um, the, the extent over which you're varying. You know, we know what that is from, from the array itself. Um, so why, why would we use index notation over a for loop? Um, one really big property uh, to me that index notation has that for loops doesn't have is data independence. So the, the description of the operation is separate from how the data is stored. If I wanted to write a for loop to do a sparse matrix vector multiply, it would not look the same as a set of for loops to do a dense matrix vector multiply, even in the simplest case, because of the way that the data is stored. Um, and this is, in a way, kind of an overdue paradigm shift. 
uh, for linear algebra that already occurred in databases. Um, there was a time before relational algebra where when people wrote a query over a database, they would have to figure out, oh, well, how is my database stored? And they'd write some code that kind of is related to the storage structure of their database. And then somebody came along and they said, relational algebra would be a good, a good description of uh, how to do this. And so, uh, so one of the other benefits of index notation is that the operation is data and it's not instructions. So you can kind of do what you want with the data of, of, your, uh, of your expression um, and you don't, you, don't have to, you, don't have to follow the, you don't have to follow the control flow. Um, and sometimes index notation can restrict you but this can make it easier to reason about. So here's a kernel. Um, I don't know if you recognize this. This is MTTKRP. It's a matrix size tensor times Petri Rao product. Um, this is a really, uh, it, this seems like kind of a crazy kernel, but this is actually really important. It's the solution to a least squares problem in uh, tensor factorization. So if you want to factor a tensor into a bunch of uh, rank one tensors, then, then you, might, you might have to use this kernel. And here, uh, Tamara Kolda is telling us that it looks like this sometimes in, uh, in some data science circles. So I, I, I ask you, how would you implement this in Julia um, now? If, if you were tasked with sort of, and this is kind of a brave question to a room full of expert Julia users, I've realized this now. Um, how would you write this in Julia? Um, you, 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 yeah, you might use einsum.jl. That, that would be the smart thing to use, right? But if you, if you weren't going to use index notation, right, you'd be using a set of for loops, right? That, that, that's sort of the simplest way. Um, if you wanted to use the broadcast machinery, it might look like this. Um, and, and, and this is sort of a, if, if you wanted to take advantage of, I mean, what I, what I, the two ones that I just showed you, they're not gonna be super fast, but if you wanted to maybe take advantage of some you know, linear algebra kernels, right? we could use a gem here. So what we're doing is kind of contracting those two little L's, we get an IKL and then we get rid of the uh, K. Um, we can do that in two different ways. This one's my favorite. We take a Kronecker product and get a diagonal at the end. Maybe we use map slices. Um, so I've been trying to wrap taco. Um, so the project that I've written is, uh, it's, it's called uh, Tortilla. It's a wrapper for taco. Um, and it, <laughs> So it's, it's still in the prototype phase. You know, we're messing with the syntax and trying to make sure that it can sort of correspond to several syntaxes that uh, other tensor compilers use. But you might end up writing something like this. Or as Chris said, you might use one of the several existing uh, Einstein summation packages in Julia already. And so one thing that my roommate asked me when I showed him this was, how fast does it go? And the answer is, if you just have index notation compile the for loops, it goes about as fast as for loops. But one of the nice things is that our operation is data. So what we can do is our operation is just a Julia type. When we run the execute function on our Julia type, we can just say, well, I already know how to do MTTKRP. Um, we should use the fourth kernel because that one was the fastest. And then after our cheating, uh, we have, <laughs> it's just as fast as the other one. Um, and, and so this is, this is sort of a, it, Index notation implementations don't have to compete with existing kernels. They can just recognize them. They only have to compete with the kernels that we would write ourselves in the same amount of time. Um, so I have several examples. I'm running a little short on time, but here's some just examples of how we might express some things in various domains using index notation and variants. So this is a stencil. Stencil computation can be expressed kind of using index notation. Um, this notation is a little powerful, right? So we we use a padded view here to say that we're solving the heat equation and uh, the, the edges of our heat are all a temperature of zero. Um, we can do graph algorithms with index notation. This is the floyd warshall algorithm. It, uh, it, it calculates the all pairs nearest paths. Um, the, we, can, we can do machine learning with index notation. If you want to fuse a tangent on the end of convolution, I know this is a simple example. I mean, if you really want to do machine learning, you should use flux for now. But um, <laughs> I, think, I think that uh, using, using index notation as a, as a back end for some frameworks could be a possibility in the future. 
Um, index notation has a lot of friends. One of the things I promised in this talk was a, a discussion of some of the variants. So some things that people do is they have explicit reduction locations. So here we're kind of saying that we're going to reduce something and we're going to add the reduction of another thing. Um, <coughs> Einstein summation has an interesting convention where the summation automatically wraps itself around uh, ter different terms in a sum, so different, different multi multiplies in a sum. So <coughs> this, these two are equivalent. In Einstein summation, you actually have the you actually have a sum on the right-hand uh, term, that D-I-J, D-I-J-L. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Tensor Comprehensions. It's the latest uh, Facebook uh, index notation compiler. Um, so this is what this operation would look like using Tensor Comprehensions. Uh, and uh, an, another uh, Tensor compiler that I'm going to talk about a little bit is Halide. Um, this is what it looks like in Halide. Halide is a little bit more for the people who want to write uh, implementations of kernels rather than necessarily users. It's, uh, it's more for the experts, but uh, you, can, you can kind of see that these, these, uh, these, there's similarities across all of these different <coughs> notations. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple tensor compilers that are my favorites. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then, so, so, uh, we, we've seen different applications that we can have. Um, one thing that might be interesting is that uh, you, you can use index notation as backends to libraries and frameworks. Um, we've seen the several different ways that we can express an index notation. Um, you can use code, you can use named functions, you can use dedicated languages. I might point out a fourth, which is that sometimes people have code and then they recognize that some of the code corresponds to an index notation statement. Um, there's a couple ways that people do policy. Um, some of these compilers don't have any policy, so the user has to say exactly how the operation gets scheduled, and the tensor compiler is more of a tool for writing performance-optimized software. Um, some of these are more uh, some of these are more automatic, um, and uh, people take several approaches to mechanisms. Sometimes you have to write the code by hand, right? That's the that's the for loops way, but um, if you're, if you're writing a tensor compiler, you can compose smaller functions or you can generate code. So one of the really cool um, successes of tensor compilers is this thing called the polyhedral model, which if uh, you haven't been introduced to, it's really cool. I encourage you to check it out. There's this whole like polyhedral.info that gives you like all of the different projects that use polyhedral model. Um, and essentially what it is is that if you have affine bounds on your loops and affine <coughs> array access, um, you can represent the iterations of your code as a hyperdimensional geometric object. And this, this gives you both a set of provable transformations and it also gives you an objective function. And so you can represent this using an integer linear program um, and do some provably correct optimizations and transformations on your loops. Um, one, of, one of these things that people sometimes do is they they would skew a set of loops with dependencies like this, so normally you have to go in order, but you could do the diagonal. Wow, the mouse was a bad idea. Okay. Um, so Halide is a really cool project. Um, I think the, the Halide, Halide is pr uh, used in production at Google. Um, Halide, it, I think the big contribution of Halide is that it separates the uh, description of the kernel from the schedule. So what you might do is you'd say something like, um, here's our matrix multiply product, um, and we're going to accumulate the result. Um, and then you would say how to optimize it. So you'd say, okay, I want to tile the, I want to tile the iterations, I want to specialize, and I want to fuse. Um, we can also uh, generate code for sparse tensors. Um, so this is a sparse tensor. It's got three indices. Uh, and uh, taco would represent this sparse tensor um, in kind of a tree format. So we're going to store the first mode at the top of our tree, and we're going to store the second mode. And when I say mode, I mean index. We're going to store the second index and the, at the second layer of the tree, and the third index at the third layer of the tree. And you can compress each layer, um, and, and you can compress each layer differently. So you might say, for example, a CSR matrix would, in this taco format would have a dense top layer and a sparse second layer. So the 
top layer would be there's a storage for every uh, row, and then each row is compressed. So that's the compressed sparse row format, if you've seen that before. Um, so Taco uses an interesting concrete index notation where the temporaries have to be represented explicitly um, because, uh, because it's difficult to figure out what the right storage formats are. Um, but Taco also provides a more user-friendly layer at the top where you don't have to specify temporaries explicitly. Um, and it can sort of try and guess what the right one to be would use. Um, Taco uses this interesting technique uh, called merge lattices to figure out how to generate code for a sparse tensor. Um, so what, what, it's, what it does is it, it computes which tensor uh, indices need to be merged at every level of the loop nest. So if you had a, if you had a sparse matrix vector multiply like this, um, so you would put some loops around it, uh, and then you would say, okay, at the top level, we know that there's only going to be a zero in A if there's a non-zero row of B and a non-zero element of D. And then at the second level, we can say, okay, for every non-zero row of B, we need, to do the, we need to perform an intersection because we're doing a multiplication, right? If, Z, if C is zero and B is one, we still get a zero as an output of that operation. So the different um, operators correspond to whether or not the output will be zero or not. Um, and you can perform this sort of merge. Um, so as I've been wrapping TACO, one of the observations that I've came across is that um, because the TACO array types are parameterized by the storage of each mode, um, any sort of Julia TACO wrapper library would need to implement a lot of the uh, basic Julia array functions, um, like git index and find non-zeros and permute dims. Um, and implementing these operations requires a lot of work if your array type is super parameterized. But it doesn't require a lot of work if you represent your uh, git index and your broadcast and your permute dims as, a, as index notation themselves. So you can actually use the compiler to, uh, to solve the problem of implementing an array library. Um, So I, I'd like to conclude by showing you a lot of really cool existing, or giving, giving you a shout out to cool existing Einstein summation packages, um, index notation packages. Uh, I, I feel like the, any sane person's reaction to seeing one of these is why don't we just implement all of linear algebra with one of these syntaxes? It's so cool. It's very expressive. Um, anyways, uh, so I, I think we should. Um, all, of these, all of these things kind of follow this homegrown Julia DSL pattern. You have a sugary macro, a parameterized AST. Um, by parameterized, I mean that the type of the AST actually encodes the whole operation. And because of that, you can pass the whole operation to a generated function. Um, you can perform whatever operations you want at compile time. You can have a very fancy stack. You can have a very simple compiler stack. It doesn't matter. Um, and then you can pass the result to your beautiful Julia code. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of using Julia, and one of the reasons I think Julia is, is really uh, one of the perfect languages to implement these things, is that you don't even need to generate fast code. You can just generate code that Kino can make fast with the optimizer, <laughs> um, which is really, really, uh, it, it, it's quite amazing what, what the optimizer can do. Um, and so I, I know I promised uh, a talk about the future, so I, I, I just, uh, to, to give a quick summary here, um, in the future, I don't, I don't think that numerical libraries will be the norm. Um, I, think that, I think that loop languages and uh, tensor compilers will be what we ship, um, and a numerical library will just be a set of convenience wrappers around index notation. Uh, there will be some limited expressiveness with index notation, but uh, you can increase the automation because you know more about your uh, expression. Um, I think the other thing that this can enable is more expressive array types. You can use the sort of taco style sparsity patterns to implement uh, really specific um, array types. And I think that Julia is uh, a really good language for this. Um, and I think another thing that we might see in the future is currently a lot of these tensor compilers use you know, different levels, or it, it, they, they produce an, a tensor compiler that makes contributions at all of the levels of the lasagna stack that you saw. I think that in the future, if people can start uh, 
unifying the expressions of index notation in various IRs, you can kind of uh, start to uh, stand on the shoulders of giants a little bit more with these. Um, so that's, this is, uh, that's, that's all I have to say. I think I could show a demo though. Um, so I don't know if I actually tried the demo. Oh, cool. Oh, wow, I'm going to have to code like this. Okay. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we can do is, so we'll load the, load the package first. So we can express an operation. This is sort of showing the, showing the homegrown Julia DSL stack here. Um, and we get our typed AST. Um, we can look at the type of this AST and it encodes the whole, it encodes the whole thing. So this is kind of, it's, it's a little bit tough to operate on this for the compiler, right? Um, so one of the things that we do is when we pass this type to the generated function, um, we actually, we could speed up our compilation process by making a sort of untyped AST out of it. Um, so then what, so then what we would have is something, um, something where now, now the types are a little bit more stable as we operate on this. Um, and we can, uh, we can check out, so we can say, okay, what is the, uh, so, so one thing we can do is we can um, canonicalize the representation of our um, AST so that we get something that is recognizable and then we pass that to a function that gives us our recipe for implementing that. So in this case, it's a, it's a gem, uh, believe it or not. Um, and, oh. <coughs> And so then when we write a function that uses this, so this is, this is kind of my, my uh, statement about Pino here. Um, this is what it looks like uh, when we lower the code. But if you actually follow all the types all the way through the expression, um, so we had that whole AST, but when we do our code typed, it's just to call the gem. It's amazing, you know, is, and, and the, the optimizer in general, all of the folks and all of the, all of the contributors is really amazing. So thanks for your time. Very nice, uh, very nice talk. And, and I very much agree with your vision of, of wanting to essentially defer all these things to an indexer. I've, I've dipped in and out of this world, and I've been out for a little while, so I may be out of date. But last I checked, um, Polly was still, I think, a research project, right? In, in the sense that it wasn't yet to the point where it could be reliably counted on to perform the same kind of optimizations that a hand-tune optimization by someone who really knows what they're doing, uh, you know, does. And likewise, if I remember correctly, with Halide, they backed away a little bit from the from the promise that you really wouldn't have to think about scheduling. They, they, they've they've largely transitioned to a library where it makes it easy for you to try out several different schedulers and, and see which one works best and then go with that one. Um, is it, but, but I could be outdated in this. Um, so what, so, so I mean, but is it fair to say that there are some genuinely hard optimization problems here that still remain to be worked out if we really want to get the very best performance from a very general purpose library like this? I, I, uh, I, I think I should say, yes, it's fair to say that it's hard. Um, I hope I didn't make it look easy, or I hope I didn't make it sound like it was an easy problem to solve. Um, so uh, a couple of things, Halide has a new, um, as of 2016, I think they have a new auto tuner for, for creating their schedules, um, and it's, it's better than the previous. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think the other thing to think about is that a, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, notions of fastest um, is really it's it's a question of what percentage of what percentage of the hand tuned optimiz like the hand tuned kernel do you want right so I think that in a lot of these cases you can get something like you know seventy percent of what the hand tuned kernel is right and for a kernel that nobody was thinking about that nobody wanted to implement seventy percent of the best hand tuned is like good enough right and for the kernels that we do know about we can write those um, so that's that's uh, that's what I would say to that.
Yeah. So yeah, so you forgot to mention uh, GPUs and CUDA native, right? This looks like you're going to be building GPU code. Is that down the line for Taco and uh, or I mean, is there a way so that says that we can try try to start plugging into it and start seeing if this can work? So now that you asked that question, I uh, remember something that I wanted to say, which is that um, I think Julia's model of parallelism is very cool, um, and it's very it's very beautiful the way that you can sort of express parallelism in an array, um, and and so uh, if if you want to if so so I think. Taco has uh, Taco has a plan to implement GPU support, um, and and uh, it, the the plan for Tortilla is also to have GPU support, hopefully through CUDA native. I think that that's 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 what I would say to that. Um, if I, I think that finishing up my previous point. Um, if, if we want to express parallelism through the arrays, then we need to give the users the right operations that they can perform on them that can be automatically parallelized. I think that that's, that's, that's really the, the sentiment. So you also talked about the graph blahs during I this talk? I did talk about the graph blahs. Uh, I, I didn't say it. I should have said it, yes. Um, so uh, how far do you see that going? What do you think the future of graph blahs is? And how Taco fits into that future? Yeah, so this is, this is a question that I, uh, I've, I've been trying to answer with uh, my friends uh, who work on Taco as well. And I, I think that for several graph operations, the answer is that you can represent the graphs compactly as sort of sparse matrices, um, and it, there's really a strong case. But I think that for certain graph operations like these, like uh, it, uh, graph operations where you need to do very complicated inner loops or where you you know, uh, do, do, like, like if, if it doesn't, there, there are, I guess what I'm saying is there are, um, there are graph operations that do not fit in this framework. And, and so I, I don't know if I can solve all of those problems. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this thing is here once again. 